Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at First Baptist Church of Yazoo City. Of all the choices you have to make today, I am honored that you have chosen to worship with us in the comfort of your home. As you sit back, would you also participate in the service and allow the Lord to transform your life? So that's why we are here today. Thank you again for joining us. May God bless you today. The Lord strengthens and protects me. I trust in Him with all my heart. I am rescued and my heart is full of joy. I will sing to him in gratitude. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. Why don't you stand with me and let's begin singing together. I will worship with all of my heart. So sing it with me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the
worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship Him. Dear Lord, we gather here today to worship your holy name. For great is your name and worthy to be praised. Your name is higher than any other name. And as you sit upon your throne today with the whole world in your hand, yeah, you've given us a promise that you meet with us in this place. Lord, attune your ear to the prayers offered in this place. Listen to the praise that we bring. And Lord, as you look within our heart, May we present a heart to you that's ready for you to work today. So help us to still ourselves in your presence and to know that you are God. Let us exalt your name. Let us be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. For we commit this time to you. Use it for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I appreciate you being here today. It's great to be back with you. Thank you on behalf of your Chile Mission team for your prayers and your support. Bottom line is, we had a great trip last week, and lives were impacted. And uh, we've been praying today even for the service that's probably getting close to wrapping up in Malache, uh, for the people that we encountered that gave uh, proof of the Lord's work in their life and promises they were going to be involved in service this morning and look forward to hearing uh, what happened there today. But as we focus on now, I'm thankful that you're here. And to know that we get together, we get to praise the Lord together. Many of you have joined us, your guests. Thank you for the honor of your presence. Uh, if you would, uh, take the bulletin, and there's a flap on it. If you would fill that out, place in the offering plate, the end of our service is your gift to us today. We'd be honored by that. Also, if you're a church member and you have a ministry need or prayer request, there's a place for you on the bulletin flap to submit those and invite you to do so. As we get here today, let's just, as the choir sings this next song, let us simply embrace 
the cross. you were on his mind in fact as I tell the kids in the kids ministry before your mom and dad even knew one another he knew exactly what you were going to be like and he paid the price for all your stuff would you stand with me you stood before creation Eternity in your hands. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failures and carried the cross for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my soul now to stand so what can I say i 
It is our prayer that the Word of God would speak to us by His Spirit. This morning, if you would join us in John chapter 6. This morning, we are beginning a church-wide campaign. Many times we'd call it a sermon series, but it involves more than just now. Entitled, Not a Fan. We are going to begin with our small groups next Sunday night, where you will discuss in small groups what we talk about on Sunday morning. We'll have a little different schedule next Sunday or, or different worship service next Sunday morning and we'll be talking about that. So therefore, you're going to have to pay deep attention this week because what we talk about this week, you've got to remember till next Sunday. I know that's not a challenge for most of you, but our deacons, maybe they'll catch it. And uh, So, but 
we're going to begin to look at this idea of not being a fan of Jesus, but to be a follower. So this morning, I want us to ask the question, are you a fan or follower? In John chapter 6, we see, I believe, one of the, one of the saddest verses in Scripture. We're going to begin in verse 60, and I believe you'll know when we get there. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the life of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Many, verse 66, turned back and no longer followed him. They were fans. Charlie Moore moved into a new community, and therefore a new church with his family, he was trying to make new friends and settle in, develop some good relationships, so he joined a local church league softball team. Charlie wasn't a very good athlete. His wife didn't necessarily want him to play, afraid of the embarrassment that he may bring upon himself, but Charlie wanted to get to know some of the guys. The first game came, and Charlie got up to the plate. He put his feet in. He got the bat back. He waited for the ball to come. And as it got close, he swung with all of his might, and he missed the ball completely. The crowd groaned. He heard, though, down the third baseline, somebody go, You can do it, Mr. Moore. He turned and he saw his little boy was the one giving him encouragement. The second pitch came. He watched it closely, swung with all of his might. He missed it. The crowd once again groaned, and once again down the third baseline, he heard the words, You can do it, Mr. Moore. The third pitch came. He knew this was it. Again, swung with all of his might. Completely missed it. Strike three. He's out. And the shame that comes with striking out in slow pitch softball, he walked back to the dugout. And he heard the words, It's okay, Mr. Moore. The game was over. He got back in the car with his family. And he asked his little boy, Son, was that you that was encouraging me, shouting words of encouragement? Yes, sir, Daddy, that was me. Thank you very much for that. That meant a lot to me. But son, why did you call me Mr. Moore? He said, Dad, I really didn't want anybody to know I was related to you. <laughs> Let me ask you this morning, how often are we happy to show up and shout encouragement at church, but yet we live like we're not related to Christ? We tell others that God can do anything, yet we doubt that he can move mountains in our lives. We shout out, oh, Jesus, you can do it. Jesus, you can move the mountains. Jesus, you can save lives. Jesus, you can restore my marriage. Jesus, you can save my child. Jesus, you can fill in the blank. And we believe that he can do it, but that is about it. A key question we must ask this morning, are you a fan or a follower. See, a fan just shows up. There are folks who just come to church. They don't do much for Jesus because they have other priorities, but they were at church. They'll stay as long as it benefits them, but when it no longer benefits them, they usually do not stay. As long as they're happy, they'll show up, but they often get easily offended when they cannot have their own way. And seeing how easily we get upset with things within the church and with other believers, it breaks my heart to think how many fans are in the church. 
I'm a sports fan. I mean, I, I like watching sports. I'll pick out a team for next Sunday if the Super Bowl to watch, and it'll be depressing to know there's not any football for months. But I got my team. You know, I mean, I, football, I, I kind of root, try to root for the Cowboys, and, you know, that's a, boy, it's desperate. And baseball fan, I'm a Cubs fan, 100 years plus of futility. I watch the games, though. I get frustrated. I turn it off. I go about life. It really doesn't bother me. I'm just a fan. But you know I'm a follower of one certain team. You've got your team as well. But when it comes to my beloved Razorbacks, if it's on, I'll watch gymnastics. <laughs> I didn't know they had such a team the last few years. I watch the game. I get frustrated. I yell. I don't think I throw things, but I might throw something. How they play affects my life. I proudly wear a hog. I decorate stuff with it. I'm a follower. I read every day. At some point in the day, some, the latest news. I mean, it's about to be National Signing Day. We're going to talk about recruits. I can tell you who visited this past weekend, who were on, who's going to be good. I can tell you scores. I can tell you history because I'm a follower of them. And what they do impacts my life. Now, how often when we look at the Lord and we look at His work, does who He is and what He does impact our life? Or can we simply be a fan? See, Jesus calls us with two words. Follow me. He looked at the first disciples. He called them from fishing. Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say, hey, you guys, come believe in me. He didn't say, hey, why don't y'all come listen to me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Why don't you come hang out with me? Come see the miracles I'm going to do. Come, follow me. And Luke chapter 9, he tells us to take up our cross daily and follow me. He doesn't say to like me. He doesn't even say, believe me. Now, Paul would later tell us that belief, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But see, it's a belief that leads to a changed life. It's a belief that leads to action. Jesus doesn't even say, come support me. Come and worship me. Come follow me. And that's the call to each of us today. Are you a fan or follower? See, in this passage, there was a great crowd that was there. They had, had flocked to Jesus because of what he was doing and the way in which he was teaching. But as we read there in verse 60, many of the disciples began to say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Basically saying, this is tough. I'm not sure it's worth it. And Jesus challenged them. And from that time, many of the disciples walked away. See, the word disciples here is not refer to the twelve. It refers to the crowd. The crowd that had come and followed. The crowd that came because of what Jesus was doing. The crowd that came because he, had, he taught with one who had authority unlike any they had ever heard before. They came. They were disciples because they were walking with him, but then they walked away. And I believe the question that Jesus turned and he asked the twelve is still to us today. Do you want to leave too? Because a fan will answer yes. I want us to notice the differences this morning between a fan and a follower. The first difference I see is that there's a difference in motivations. Just a day or so before this instance that we read, you'll see in the first part of chapter 6, Jesus had been teaching a huge crowd. And it tells us that 5,000 men had gathered to hear Jesus teach. And as the day progressed, they were getting hungry. So Jesus performed a miracle by taking a little boy's lunch, five small loaves and two small fish. And he blessed them, and he broke them, and he began to feed the disciples. Women and children were possibly there, anywhere from fifteen to 20,000 people, most estimate. And when it was all over, the disciples gathered up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. For Jesus had done a remarkable miracle in feeding the people in a time when they were hungry. The crowd was so impressed that we're told in verse 14 and 15 that they intended 
to take Jesus by force and make him to be their king. So knowing that, Jesus slipped away from the crown to get away from them. And later that night, his disciples are on the water, and he walks on the water to join them as they go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But if you've got your Bible in John chapter 6, we see in verse 23, that then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. They went searching for Jesus. Why did they go? They went searching for Jesus because Jesus had fed them. Jesus had given them a free lunch. You give me a free lunch, I'm going to show up most of the time. And you're the same way. They had, Jesus had met a need, and it didn't cost them anything. Now they've come back for more food, and they come back because they want to see another miracle. But listen, Jesus didn't come to offer you a luncheon buffet. And he has no intention of feeding these individuals at this time. For he knew they were fans. And they got upset about that. For they were following him because they wanted to see the next miracle. They wanted what they could get out of it. And so they walked away. When they found out that following Jesus wasn't going to be a journey of miracles. See, if Jesus wanted the crowd, Jesus would have gave them what they wanted. He would have welcomed them. He would have found somebody else's lunch, or he would have created it out of nothing, and he would have fed the people, and he would have done it every day, and they would have followed him. But Jesus doesn't want the crowd. He doesn't want fans. He wants followers. And it comes down to our motivations. Now, this is not to say that the Lord doesn't bless us, for indeed he does. For today, you've been given life. You have the chance. You've got to get up. You're still breathing. That's a blessing. You have the physical ability to get up and to be here. We had the blessing to be able to come into this place and gather to worship. We had the blessing of knowing that he meets with us here. We had the blessing that we leave from here. We're, most of us are going to go eat, and most of us are thinking about right now what we're going to have for lunch. We know what we're going to do today, how, how our day is pretty well going to go, and basically we would sim- summarize and say that we have a blessed life. That we're going to get up tomorrow. Most of you are going to go to work. You're going to go to a warm house. When the weather changes, you're going to have a place of protection. When the storm comes, we are indeed blessed. But listen here. If we lose everything we have tomorrow, if all we do tomorrow is wake up, and none of the things we would consider a blessing today are still here, if we lose everything tomorrow, know that the Lord is still the supreme God. He's still the Lord of the universe. He's still the Savior of souls. And He is still worthy of our praise. And he's still worthy of every worship that we could give him. But when our motivation is what we get in return, we are fans, and we will not stick around. Because if everything was taken away tomorrow, and you're a fan, you'd begin to wonder why God would turn his back on you. Does God even love you? And we would begin to question, because of our motivations, the goodness of God. But a follower makes a commitment and keeps it. Now, there are times of strain, for we're all sinners. But even during that time of strain, because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we desire to be faithful. And we're repenting, we're confessing, and we're coming back to where the Lord wants us to be. But bottom line is a commitment has been made, and we do not walk away. Many of you have made decisions in a worship service such as this one. Or you made a decision before and you made it public in this, during this time when in the service like we'll do today. We have a, we'll call it an invitation, a time of commitment. A song is saying and you begin to move. And you let know, know what the Lord was doing in your life. Those songs we sang are so impactful. For they're always a song of an open invitation. We sang for years just as I am. Without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. A reminder that as we come to the Lord, we come with nothing but just who we are. We don't have to clean up our life, but we just present ourselves as we are to him. We sing that song, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. What do we surrender? We surrender all. And how do we give it? We give it freely. And probably one of my favorite ones, though, is the song, Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, 
I will follow where he leads me. I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Where will you go? Where he leads. How far will you go? All the way. Hey, when we are a follower, that is our commitment. Lord, I do surrender all. I follow you all the way. Wherever you lead, I'm going to go. But fans change it up just a bit. They sing, I'll go with you till the summer. When the fish start biting and baseball games have to be played. And I'm just tired from all the running around. I'll go with you till the fall. When the bucks start grunting and the football's passed in the air. I'll go with you till life's a bummer. And I don't feel like getting out of bed. Or somebody hurts my feelings. Or God hasn't worked the way that I wanted. Then it's so long, so long, all the way. See, a fan, when it's convenient, is quote-unquote committed. But a follower is one who doesn't look at convenience, doesn't look at motivations of what we're going to get in return, but is simply being obedient. So I'll make it even more personal. A fan will serve when everybody serves when it's convenient on a Sunday afternoon. But they won't necessarily show up on a Saturday morning. A fan is all about being in a small group until it starts on Super Bowl Sunday. And they may have to miss a little bit of the game. And so they walk away. And then a fan really has a tough time when the second time it meets is on Valentine's night. And they forget that they have other nights of the week they can take their Valentine out to eat. And they walk away. And they give up. Those are trivial things you might say. But they show that we have other motivations and other priorities in our life. And in that moment, in that decision, we have essentially done what happens here in verse 60, and we walk away and we no longer follow him, at least in that moment, in that point of time. See, fans give up and they walk away. Or worse, they stay and they damage the church. But followers of Jesus follow no matter where he leads them and what is happening in their life. This morning, what is your motivation? Why are you here? So I hear all the time, man, if... When I don't come to church, my week just, just doesn't seem to go right. And I know that's true. There's something about gathering with the body of Christ. But listen to me. If you're here so the rest of your week will go right, you are not a follower. You're a fan because you're here because of what you can get out of Jesus. For if we're not here for any other reason than to give him the worship that he deserves and to praise his name because he is the one who created us, who sent his son to die for us, he gives us forgiveness, he works in our life, and he is the boss, he's the savior of the world. If for no other reason than our motivations need to be checked this morning. For we should be here because of who he is and his stake upon our life. And we should live our life for him every day because of who he is and his stake upon our life. Not because of what we can get out of him, not because of what he may do, not so that our life will go smooth or for any other reason. But we follow him because that's the call that he issued. Come, follow me. There's another difference I see between fan and follower, and that's the difference in accepting the message. In the middle of chapter 6 here, Jesus begins to teach. One of his I am statements that he made. And he had told them that I am the bread of life in verse 35. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In verse 41, listen what happens. At this, the Jews there begin to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose mother and father we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? And Jesus begins to further to teach them. Tells them in verse 43, stop grumbling among yourself. And then he comes to verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews begin to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give up his flesh to eat? And then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. 
For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, and whoever, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now we read that, it even sounds a little bizarre to us. Eating his flesh, drinking his blood. Imagine hearing that for the first time how you would feel. Something is just not quite right about that. And if you think of Jesus' words literally, you would be right. But Jesus here is speaking spiritual words filled with spiritual truths. He's not talking about literally eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He is referring to the fact that he will soon die on the cross. And when that happens, his flesh will be torn. His blood will be shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus is not talking here about communion or what we now know as the Lord's Supper. But he's talking about us having life because Jesus did what he did. And we find our nourishment as Christians when we feed on his sacrifice. When we base our life upon the work of the cross, we find fulfillment. And that's what Jesus is teaching in this passage. Yet so many of them couldn't grasp that because he wasn't fitting into their mold. That wasn't what the Savior was supposed to do. No way in the world was he supposed to die. And they grumbled about Jesus. They're arguing about the identity of Jesus. Now granted, they're there because they saw the miracle. They're there because they want to be fed again. They're there because they want something else out of him. But they don't want this whole talk of dying and the cross and flesh and blood. And they argued about his teaching. Verse 52, they begin to argue sharply among themselves. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, we're told in John 1 1. Jesus is also the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he said. What Jesus says is not open for discussion. He is the Son of God, and that is not debatable. We can't sit around and argue. We should not sit around and argue about the identity of Jesus nor what he taught because those things are nothing for which we can argue and debate about. For he is clear in his message and in who he is. And a fan doesn't like those things, but a follower accepts them completely. See, the message of Jesus is difficult. There's nothing a fan wants to hear. Take up your cross. And follow me. A reminder that we must sacrifice our life. Daily, he says. To live as a daily sacrifice in order to follow him. He said that the last will be first and the first shall be last. And he's not looking for a place, a position, but he's looking for those who will serve. He talked about going to a banquet and not sitting at the place of honor, but sitting at the back of the room in a place where nobody else wanted to sit because you don't consider yourself greater than anyone else. He taught that man cannot serve two masters. He said, you'll hate one and love the other. You cannot serve both God and money, he got explicit about. His message focuses on the heart, not on outward appearance. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you. You've heard that it was said, do not murder, but I tell you, do not hate your brother, or you're just as guilty as murder. Jesus taught a message that was hard, and then he commanded us, you're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He reminded us that we are to impact the darkness and penetrate the darkness and preserve the world in which we live. And yet, a fan will never do that. The fans stopped following Jesus, Jesus because they didn't like what he said. Jesus had offended them. He had pushed them beyond their comfort. So they left, and they did not come back. In the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would teach those of you who take these words of mine and put them into practice like a man who built his house upon the rock. The winds came, the rain poured down, the waters came up, and the house stood. Those who do not take these teachings of mine are like the man who built his house on the sand. 
The winds came, the rain fell down, the waters rose up, and the house was destroyed. You build your life upon the sand, you're fan. You build your life upon the message of Jesus and his identity, you become a follower. And if the storms of life can come, the winds can come and attack you, your life can be flooded with all kinds of things that are trying to bring you down. And yet, when we as a follower accept his message, we will stand. Today, not only do we check our motivations, but what about the message? Have you accepted that full, hard message? Even those things that we don't like to hear? Because you can say that truly you are a follower of the Lord. There's one other motivation. Excuse me, one other difference I see, and that's the difference in belief. When the crowd got upset with Jesus, they began to grumble about him. They were saying that Jesus was a liar. This is Joseph, this is Mary, and Joseph's boy. He couldn't possibly come down from heaven. We know all about him. He grew up with us. We know who he really is. He's not his Messiah. And what gets me is that it did not bother them to speak ill of Jesus because they were concerned about looking good in their own eyes. Fans will do that because they're not committed to Jesus. They don't care about insulting him with their words. They don't care about the discontent they stir up within the family of God. They don't care if they take God's name in vain through their words and their deeds. All they care about is justifying themselves. See, thanking God for things in life while consistently living in a manner that brings dishonor to his name is a common form, maybe the most common form we have today of taking his name in vain. And when we profess him and we don't live like he's called us to live, we have cursed the name of God. These people didn't bother them to speak ill of Jesus. And many times, as followers, it doesn't bother you to take his name in vain. But followers wouldn't think of hurting Jesus. Jesus is all they're about. I don't know how long of a pause there was between verse 66 and 67. But many walked away. And in my mind, I picture that the crowd leaves. And that Jesus turns and he looks at the twelve. Do you not want to leave too? They all left. There's your invitation for you to go. Here's your opportunity. Do you want to go along with them? And Peter answers. And we make fun of Peter. He puts his foot in his mouth so many times. But Lord, to whom shall we go? What, where, where can we go? For you have the words of eternal life. And we, imagine Peter goes, we, us, Lord, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Lord, where else will we go? You have what we need in our lives. We don't want anyone else. We will follow wherever you lead. That's the commitment that Peter is making. But did you notice Jesus points out one of you is the devil. Judas is present. He's still standing there with the twelve. What concerns me is that fans of which Judas was one can go a long distance before they walk away. They're not always easy to pick out. But they're not marked by belief. And belief is necessary in being a follower. And that ought to sound a warning to us. Is that you can do spiritual things. You can hang out with Jesus like Judas did. You can see his work in the world around you. And yet, still be a fan. Because it takes the personal decision of each one of us to believe He is the Son of God who paid the price for our sin and deserves for us to surrender our life to Him. Today, 
Are you a fan or a follower? It's real simple to look at these three differences and determine which you are if you're honest with yourself. And it begins with belief. You go to a ball game, especially if your team is the home team and you root with all your might for them. And late in the game, you realize your team is not going to win. They're going to get beat. They can't come back at a certain point. Maybe the opponent's score another touchdown, and you realize there's no way in the world they can come back. And instantly, after that final, that last score that makes up the difference, you will see the fans begin to leave. Why well, stay toward the, until the end when you know what the outcome's going to be? You can meet the crowd out of the parking lot, get home a little early, get to the restaurant a little sooner. And so the fans go home. And that's what I picture as I read this passage. The stadium's full, people gathered around Jesus, and Jesus tells them, I'm not going to feed you again. I'm the bread of life. What you need is to follow me and you'll be filled. You'll have everything that you need. you have all the nourishment you need in your life. And they begin to think, I can't do that. And the stadium empties. Listen, as followers of Jesus, we've won. I'll let you know that secret. We're victorious. It may feel like there's times when we're, getting, we're being defeated. It may feel like there's times we can't come back. But as the Lord carries out his plan in the world, the cross and an empty tomb prove to us that we are victorious. Why remain a fan and walk away when we can be a follower and get to experience the complete victory. Let us check our motivations. Let us check our message. And let us believe. Would you bow with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed. Today, I want to ask you, which of those two groups would you be in? If you looked at your spiritual life right now, would you be standing there with the twelve? Or would you walk away? The church answer is, oh, I'm one of the twelve. I'm a follower. What about your actions, your motivations? What do you do when life falls apart? What do you do when the next crisis comes? Have you taken up your cross and followed him? Lord Jesus, in this place today, there are fans and there are followers. Lord, let us leave here all committed to follow you. Lord, would you rid our lives of every ounce of self-righteousness? And during this time of commitment, Lord, as we sing a song of our commitment and we demonstrate that through decisions that need to be made, let us become followers. Let us not be like the crowd that walked away. Lord, there's some today who have never placed their faith in you. They've never believed. Would you give them the courage to make that decision today? Lord, draw us close to you. You are worthy, Lord, of, our, of us following you. So let it happen. In this place, in your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together? As we sing, we'll be here to receive you as you come. The altar's open. Would you be faithful? Come, follow me, Jesus says. Draw me close to you. spoken to you today and there's a decision that you need to make or some questions that you need to answer or, or just some guidance that you need for some things you're facing in life 
I'd like to invite you to call 888-JESUS-20, where you will be linked up with a counselor who can give you direction regarding the decisions that you need to make. You're also welcome to call us here at the church office on Monday morning, 746-2471. But I encourage you not to delay, not to wait until that time, but to right now take the time to make the decisions in your life which God is leading you to make. Again, that number is 888-JESUS-20. Father, we just come to you this morning just praying uh, that you will take us deeper with you. Um, we know that the Christian life is not just a, a commitment that we make on one day and then we're done, Father. Our prayer is that as a church and as, a, as an individual believer that you'll mature us and take us deeper and reveal your truth to us day by day so that we can look more and more like you and less and less like the world. Father, I just pray that you would, uh, I, I, we know that you will be faithful to meet us. Uh, Father, help us to be a, a people in a church that's willing to meet you uh, day by day. Uh, Father, we just pray as we uh, have an opportunity to give a portion of what you've given back to you that we'll, we'll do that now with an open heart. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, John. You can even make a toy sound good. Right? Man. Thank you for being here today. It's been an honor to worship with you. I hope that you note it uh, the bottom of your bulletin there is that as we leave today, uh, we will uh, take an offer, a benevolent offering. And basically that is to assist those that we come into contact with throughout the week. Uh, many of those come in the office needing assistance or uh, some are within the church family, many are not. But it's a way for you to have a hand in that and be able to supplement what we budget uh, and get that. Uh, no way we could ever know how much it's going to be, uh, but those opportunities are plentiful in our community. And we want to be able to meet as many of those we can in the name of Jesus. So uh, if you, maybe you weren't prepared to give, we didn't do a good job of reminding everybody the fifth Sunday kind of snuck up on us. But if you have uh, are able to get to that today, it would be greatly appreciated. And ushers will be at the doors as we depart. Also, you'll notice a whole slate of things that are going to start next Sunday. You have this afternoon off. Uh, that's just so that you can rest up for what's coming. Uh, next Sunday, we do begin our small groups, and you see the list of those. Those are even uh, more exhaustive, more uh, added to than the one you receive in the newsletter. So I encourage you to pick out a group and to be involved and be there next Sunday as we begin. You can register online just simply to help the host know how many to prepare for. And so if you would do that out of respect for them, it would be greatly appreciated. Also, our I Love Yazoo Day is next Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. We're going to begin with breakfast where we're going to invite all the emergency service personnel that are working that morning to join us for breakfast as a way to express our appreciation for them. And then at 9.30, we have several projects we're going to do within our community, and I hope you'll be here to get it plugged in in one of those. The next Sunday morning, uh, during this time, we're going to have Dr. Richard Ross with us. He is a professor of youth ministry at Southwestern Seminary. He's the expert, if there is one, of youth ministry. But he's one of the leading uh, youth ministers as far as training the next generation of youth ministers. He's going to be here sharing with us. There's no one with a greater passion of discipleship than Dr. Ross, and you're going to, get to hear that next Sunday morning. And then he's going to spend some time with our teenagers and their parents at lunch. And I challenge you moms and dads to be here with your team. You're not going to want to miss that time together. And uh, you're going to be hearing more about that this week. We're going to take care of any younger kids that you've got. But the, there's the challenge for you is to be here at that time. We're all going to gather to worship, and then you get to spend some time with him one-on-one, -on -one of him pouring his heart into you and your teenager and your family. So. A lot of things that are coming up in the next couple of weeks as we begin basically our, our spring semester of stuff, and we're heading into our revival season. Continue to pray and prepare your heart for that. Use the devotional guide uh, each day, and we look forward to what the Lord is going to continue to do in our church and in our individual lives. Let's stand together and just remember as we leave that He is worthy of our praise. So let's sing this as our commitment to Him as we depart. I will give Yeah.